thank you all uh, for, for tuning in uh, and hanging in throughout the day. It's been an amazing day. Um, you've had uh, your, your kickoff keynote that talked about authenticity. You've gotten lots of advice, opportunities for networking and panels, career and interview, pro tips on what to ask and what not to ask uh, in interviews. Um, and so we're going to round out this day about being able to get into the weeds of, of a particular journey, uh, my journey for today. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a bit uh, about my, my career journey uh, and where I am today uh, and how it is that I I got there. Uh, and all of this will be instructive and guiding. But what I want to say as an introduction, uh, even as I am here excited to tell you about my personal journey, what I have learned most of all and what I really know is that every role, every company, every community, every city, every culture, and every woman in that role, company, community, city, or culture is different. I can give you tips and tricks and training and strategy advice. I can tell you my story, uh, as many people can. But always remember that inside of all of this, there's only one constant. And that constant is that your identity is your superpower. Sometimes others will misunderstand it or even underestimate it, um, what you bring to the table. And that is quite unfortunate for them because the only one that really needs to understand fully what you're bringing to the table and how you intend to use it in the role that you are in in that moment is you. So uh, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my journey, uh, four things that my career journey might teach you. And then I'm gonna pivot to close out with three things I think your career journey will definitely teach you, regardless of what phase uh, in your career you are. So the first thing I'll share uh, is that uh, I am, uh, as perhaps uh, hinted at by my bio, I am a fan of STEM degrees and STEM training because folks let us do anything. I am a biomedical engineer building uh, the, my country's second largest uh, African-American history museum. Uh, and honestly, while my journey to that space is curvy, it's no mistake um, that my training and background in engineering, which is really all about problem solving, uh, I happened to choose biomedical engineering. And that was because I was leaning into the sides of my sector, my industry, my training that were most related uh, to people. Uh, and I started out in my journey in museums, in science museums and science centers. And while you may think that the conversations that we have at science centers and science museums are different than the conversations we may have at an African-American History Museum, you'd be very surprised. Um, part of what, um, what I had to learn how to do and, and teach my team to do leading a science museum was to teach people to not be afraid of algebra, right? To not be afraid of these degrees, to understanding that regardless of whether or not you became an engineer or a computer programmer, or we're going to design and build your own tech company, regardless of that, all of these conversations are so much a part of our everyday lives that everyone needs to be able to have just a little bit of that understanding. The same is true for the topics I'm trying to, to create and create space for at the International African American Museum. The only word that scares folks more uh, than algebra is perhaps racism. Uh, a close a close second. But teaching folks that these stories, these journeys are so much a part of our everyday and the way we interact, not just locally, not just regionally, not even just in the United States, but globally. Those are some of the same conversations and same skill sets. And while I was getting my degree in engineering, there is no version of me thinking, one day I'm going to use this to lead a history museum. But it was part of, of my journey uh, and my learning in that space. And so one of the things that I learned to do is to wield my training on behalf of whatever it was that I was doing, which leads me to my second point. For me, as I think about the conversations you had um, have had throughout the day, I'm not worried about your first job. Your first job will come. I'm more interested in your second job. Uh, and how you're thinking about being prepared for that. I think one of the things that often happens is that we're so focused and so stressed about getting the perfect job at this moment that we lose sight of the fact that the best part of any job is that it actually prepares you for the next one. And often you can't see what that is. I have never uh, deliberately prepared for my next step. And it's not because I haven't tried. I am a type A 
planner. I have spreadsheets and calendar appointments for everything. Okay. I'm always trying to plan things out. If you ask me what I'm going to be doing five and a half years from now on any given Tuesday, I can probably tell you because that's what my plan says. But what I have actually learned is that making those plans is good so that you always have forward momentum. But those plans are not written in concrete. And the real secret is being able to pivot when a pivotable opportunity uh, presents itself. So you learn to learn from everything in real time. And often you have no idea how you're going to use it in the next steps. So you want to take note, right? You could have a job right now that you love. You could be stepping into a job that you discover you don't like very much. It doesn't actually matter how much you like the role you have or how much you dislike the role you have. There is something that you are learning in the current role that will translate into the next adventure. So even as you're preparing for your second job, which you're always doing the minute you step into your first job, you're preparing for the next job. Don't forget to be mindful enough in the space that you are in to be able to move lessons learned in one space to the next space. In longer times and longer conversations, I can actually mark my trajectory to becoming the CEO of a history museum from my first inclinations of understanding that I was good at math and I was going to use it to save the world in the sixth grade. Luckily, we don't have time for that today. Um, but the point of the second thing that I had learned is that I didn't know that that's what I was learning at the time. So be mindful um, that whatever role, whatever space you are currently in, is actually really important for wherever it is you're going to next. And knowing exactly where you're going next is not actually required to learn the lessons. The third thing I learned, um, kind of a, a bit on the conversation that you just had, is that interview is code for telling your story. It's really interesting. Uh, and the more often you tell your story, the better you get at it. All of us have robust and complicated and interesting and multi-layered stories. That's actually why it's so hard to tell our story. The most dreaded question in any interview is supposed to be the easiest one, which is, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what has brought you here? And you're thinking, oh my God, um, there is so much. And you start panicking and trying to fit it all in. So interviews really are just about uh, telling your story. And what happens is the more often you're in those positions and are telling your story, the better you get at understanding which layers of your experience speak most to the moment uh, that you're in, which layers of your experience need to be a part of telling your story so that you can give folks a bit of a preview into who you actually are and who you intend to be in the role, which goes to uh, some previous advice, which is learn to welcome rejection. Because sometimes what I found is if you really nail being able to tell your story, folks will actually understand even before you do that you are not gonna fit in that space, that you are not gonna be happy or healthy in that space. And so thinking about interviews as an important opportunity for telling your story um, has been become part of, of the way that I approach that and understanding that the reason uh, it gets so, so complicated sometimes and feels so stressful is because each of us brings a lot of story to the table. And so the more often you're in these spaces, these interview spaces, um, particularly when you're in interview season, right? When you know you're going to be making a job change or you're going for your first job, you're in an interview season. The more interviews you have, you'll actually feel yourself getting better and better at that. The other thing to remember about um, interviewing and, and looking for jobs as I've jumped through my career is that what I wanted out of a job changed as I did. So as I grew, the different things that I wanted out of my next role uh, began to change. So in the beginning, it was what I want to do. I was very focused and I understood the kind of job that I wanted. As I grew, it went from what I want to do in a job to who I want to be in a job. And that actually comes with having lots of jobs, having to wear lots of hats, lots of roles. And then it became, well, it's not about what I'm doing. It's who I get to be in that space. And that becomes very personal. Sometimes it's about work-life balance. Sometimes it's about where you want to live, where you want to be. Sometimes it's about how you want to lead. Do you want to lead from the front, the middle, the back? Uh, and so all of those kinds of things change. So one of the things that I, I see happen is folks start freaking out when you realize, oh no, 
I no longer like my, like my job. That's simply because you've grown uh, to, to the next phase. And as you go to your next set of interviews, you'll find that the way you tell your story is just a little bit different. The fourth thing that I've learned in my career uh, journey, it's, it's not a subtle thing anymore. And I think it's something that it's really important that we say out loud is that race and gender are a factor. They are a factor. Uh, and the more intersections that you have uh, in these conversations, the more of a factor it becomes. It's a thing with a capital T. And so I often get the question, well, what, it's, what is it like to be um, a woman who's leading? What is it like to be a, a Black woman who's leading? Folks who understand the history of my country, what is it like to be a Black woman leading in the Deep South? <laughs> what is that like? What is it like to be in an engineering space? So you get these questions, um, and I realize finally and in a good way that young women who are entering the profession and who are making career changes we're finally asking those questions out loud. Those are good questions, solid questions, necessary questions. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something we need to fear or panic. We just need to be prepared. So I'm often asked, um, so how do you maintain resilience? Because there's a lot, it's a lot. How do you maintain confidence in that space? Uh, my two uh, secret weapons in that space, uh, first is the squad. Now, okay, formally we refer to that as the network, my trusted peers and colleagues, my family, but in the back of my head, when I'm talking to myself in my head, it's the squad. When I'm running into situations, it's who in the squad do I need to call? Certain members of the squad are for advice. Certain members of the squad are for um, conciliation uh, when I just need to vent and talk. Certain members of the squad are there to remind me who I am. Uh, and how powerful I am, uh, and the good work uh, that I'm that I'm doing. So your network matters. Um, I've also heard it referred to as a personal board of directors. I kind of like that one um, because boards of directors are people who volunteer to help and to do things. And so you're gonna to wanna to have a very, very diverse uh, squad. Um, we talk these days about folks um, belonging to tribes and knowing what tribes we belong to. And I think that's important. The one thing I would say about that is, if you don't have more than one tribe, you're kind of behind pace, right? It's not what tribe, it's how many tribes and do we know how to activate them? So the first thing that I use is the squad. The second thing is I ground myself in the part of what I do that's really important to me. You know, if you're working on something and you don't really care much about it, when other folks challenge you around it or try to take a, take it away from you or try to diminish your impact in that space, you're kind of like, eh, this is not worth the battle. And you will find yourself backing away. For me, I really focus on the parts of what I do that are really important to me so that when I am challenged in that space, when I am called to defend or to activate myself, um, in that space differently, it's important to me. And so therefore it's worth the fight. Um, and it's never something that, that I regret. Um, and it, it doesn't tire me out. Uh, I think the way that folks would think about it because it's important to me and I care about it. So those are the four things that sort of I've learned. I'm a fan of STEM because they let us do anything. The first job always comes. It's the second job I'm always kind of interested in making sure I'm prepared. Interviews are about telling our story and race and gender is a factor. And there are tools that we can use to empower ourselves in those spaces. So closing out really quickly, three things that I think your journey will definitely teach you. One, women approach things differently. Thank goodness. Um, given that groupthink is the death of innovation, the fact that women approach things differently is a very good thing. It has not always been honored as a good thing, but it quite frankly is. And now that we're thinking about science and technology attacking some of the biggest problems and challenges that the world has ever seen, we do need that differing perspective. We do need the approach, the special kind of approach that only a mother would bring to the table. The special kind of approach that only someone who has been questioned about their ability to be in a space would bring to the table. That special kind of something that perhaps if you had to work around or through situations, perhaps it's nurturing, perhaps it's sensitivity, perhaps it is not any of those quintessential things. But when we get in the workspace, we do indeed think differently. And this is important and it is necessary. And your journey is going to teach that to you regardless of which path you take. The second thing, 
as a leader, I'm guessing that 98% of you will decide to be a leader in some way, shape, or form, and the 2% left will smile and cheer the rest of us on <laughs> because they have chosen a different path. As a leader, you will find that you are always on two simultaneous learning curves. The first is learning to lead people. You must learn and relearn this every time you're leading people. Why? Because people are different. And the skills that we use to lead this group will not necessarily be the skills that we use to lead that group. So one, you're always learning to lead people. And two, you're always learning how to teach people to be led by you. If you think about all the things that I've shared about my previous journey uh, and the fact that we may approach things very differently, we do also have to understand we are also teaching folks how to be led um, by our perspective, by our way, by our particular type of leadership style uh, in our space. The third uh, and last thing that I know that your career journey will teach you is that your dream career is not tomorrow. It's 20 years from now. So let's exhale and simply ask ourselves, what does that dream career, that dream end game moment uh, look like? And what does this choice that I'm about to make right now mean for that journey, that point, that end point? The secret is do not judge the choice. Simply evaluate it and plan to incorporate that experience. Take notes and learn. Interestingly, this is actually not different from uh, Sister Jordan, the previous uh, moderator, from her points of advice when she said she, she's learned to sort of take everything she can from, from the moment as opposed to being so focused on the end game. We're actually saying the same thing in two different ways. I think for me to release my mind, what I found is you got to understand it doesn't have to be the perfect job right now because it's coming for you. And you don't have to stress out about your choices because every choice that you make is necessary and important for whatever that dream career is. And it's really just about understanding that. Don't look, well, this job is not going to help me get to that particular um, founding of the company that, that I want to do. That actually means that you're not evaluating that choice properly because every choice you make is going to help move you uh, in that direction. And so if you ever feel yourself hyper stressed about what it is you have to do tomorrow, think about what it is you're going to be doing in 20 years. And then just think about what you're going to do tomorrow in that way and in that vein. Again, don't judge it, simply evaluate it and learn to honor it as being important. And so with that, I'm going to end as I began. I hope that this conversation was really helpful and inspiring for you. But even if it was, remember that every role every company, every community, every city, every culture, and every woman in said role, company, community, city, or culture is different. These are tips and tricks, training and strategy and advice that I can share with you through my story. And I hope that you will have the same for many other women with many other stories. But remember, all of our stories are different and there's always only one constant. Your identity is your superpower. It's going to grow and change along with you. And sometimes your superpowers are going to be misunderstood or even underestimated about what you're bringing to the table. And that is quite unfortunate for them. But for you, your superpower is yours and yours alone. There is no such thing as anyone stealing your joy. Joy can only be given away. And the only person that needs to truly understand and master your superpower and understand what you're bringing to the table is you. And that, of course, is what good storytelling about your story will get you. Thank you.